talk about how you guys are going to do the best you can possibly do on the DBQ. All right? We remember your exam is made up of four parts. First part's multiple choice. We're going to knock that out of the park. Second part is short answer questions. We're going to knock that out of the park. Third part, we've got the DBQ. We're going to knock it out of the park. Fourth part, the long essay question. That's hard. I'm not joking with you. The long essay question is a little bit more challenging because we don't know what those questions are going into it. Now, we don't know what the DBQ is going to be. We don't know what the short answer question is going to be. We don't know what the multiple choice questions are, except for the fact that they're all going to be connected to the key concepts. And if we're studying those, we're going to hopefully be okay. But the multiple choice questions at least have a lot to jog our memory. Like you guys probably noticed, things that you would forget if I had stopped you on the street and told me to, to give me the order of the Chinese dynasties from, uh, from the Qin dynasty all the way to the final dynasty, which would be the? Yeah. Yeah. Qing dynasty. Well, okay, we, we, uh, Mao and Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, he's a guy. We haven't talked about him yet. Um, but you can maybe come up with those or maybe not come up with those. But if you saw it in front of you on a piece of paper, that's a lot easier to have your memory rekindled, right? So you're going to get a lot of questions right on the multiple choice just because the answers remind you of what the answer is. That sounds weird, but you know what I mean. Um, for the short answer question, you're probably going to have three out of the four options of the short answer. You only have to write three of them. And three out of the four options of the short answer question are going to have some stimulus that goes along with it. A picture, maybe a map, maybe a, a document to read. So you've got something to base your response on and also to kind of jog that memory. The DBQ, it's all documents, right? You've got seven do you got a question and then seven documents to kind of shape your thinking, right? So you don't have to make stuff up on those questions. The long essay question, we got to make sure we know something, right? Now, you're going to get options. You're going to get a choice of, of, of a few different questions, and you pick the one that you like the best. So that's helpful for us. Um, and you're going to find one that you feel that you can write pretty well. But for today, we're going to talk about the DBQ, because we want to knock the DBQ out of the park. Now, what do I consider knocking out of the park for the DBQ? It's out of seven points total. I would love every single one of you to get four, five, six points. If you get seven, that's, a, that's an icing on the cake, right? If you're getting a seven on your DBQ, you're probably on your way to a five overall. A seven is a lights out score. That's like getting every single point on the DBQ. You do not have to get a seven on the DBQ to get a five on your AP exam. We already looked at that chart a couple weeks ago, right, to, sh to show how much leeway there is on each of the assignments to, to lose a point here or lose a point there. So what I'm really going to work towards today is getting us to a place where every single one of us is not going to get a seven, but every single one of us can get that like three, four, five, because if you're getting a three, four, five, maybe even a six, you're going to pass your history exam. You're going to get, like, if you're someone that's like, I kind of feel like I'm a two. I'm going to get a two on my history exam, which I hope is none of you. Um, if you can get that three, four, five points on your DBQ, you won't be a two. You'll probably be at least a three or a four, all right? Or if you feel like you're a three or four, if you can get that to a five or six points on your DBQ, you might make yourself a four or a five. We're going to grab every additional point we can. And it is not hard. It is not hard. Everybody say it with me. The DBQ is not hard. It's not hard. <laughs> now say it like you believe it. DBQ is easy. Whoa, that's the, the DB, I wouldn't go with the DBQ is easy. <laughs> uh, that's a little crazy. But it's not like difficult. It's manageable. There are some steps to follow. I'm going to give you the steps and you can all do this. Sometimes for one reason or another, kids are afraid of the DBQ. You are not to be afraid of this. You embrace this. This is like the AP and College Board giving you accessible points. And we're going to take them all. All right? So what I got on the board here is our rubric. Now, there is an official College Board rubric for the DBQ. I don't like to give that to you guys because I don't like their language. I like my language a little bit better. So I don't even want, if you want to read it, knock your socks off. You can find it online. It's probably in your test prep books. You can look at it there. But I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you the, the rubric in my language, which is a little bit from the, the actual College Board's language. But I 
think this is going to set it up so it, it, it's a little bit more manageable for you. So there are seven points total, all right? All of us are going to earn those first three points. And most of us are going to be earning those first three points within the first paragraph and a half of our, of our paper, all right? First two are going to come in the first paragraph. So point number one is the contextualization point, or just call it context, because it's a lot easier to spell. We have to start our papers off, and I want you to start your paper off with this. Your first sentence or two or three is going to be to describe the context in which this question exists. And so we already looked at this class a couple weeks ago. We looked at the African actions and reactions to European imperialism, right? To the, 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 the scramble for Africa. Do you guys remember looking at that? Okay. The context of that question would be the, rise, the Industrial Revolution and the rise of wealthy and powerful European nations that need to uh, access more resources and find markets for those resources. And now with the Industrial Revolution, they're going to have the ability to conquer those territories, maybe in Africa, that they hadn't previously had. That is our context. In more general terms, the context for your question is, I like to think of it like uh, the forest and the tree, all right? The question is the tree, the specific focus that we need to be looking at, African actions and reactions. The context is the forest. Where does that tree live, right? What is the environment, the time, the history shaping that question? That's what we're looking for. Um, or maybe think of it like this. The, the, the question that we're answering, and this is the same. DBQ and LEQ both have this context point. The question lives within a chapter of a book, right? Or within a, a period of AP world. One, two, three, four, five, or six, although you've got to use some actual language. So where does that question live? That is the world history context. What chapter would you find it in? Which section of the history would we, be, would we talk about it? That's our world history context. Okay? So you're going to start us off with that. That opens your paper. That's the first couple sentences. So by the time your reader in Salt Lake City is reading your essay, by the time he is two or three sentences into your paper, he should be giving you one point for context. And now that you've earned that one point, you are halfway, or maybe even more than halfway, to the average score on the DBQ each year. The scores on the DBQs are low, but that's okay. We want, them, we want everybody else to not hear this. We want everybody else to write lousy DBQs so you guys do better and, and leap above them. All right. So that's our first point. Then we get to our thesis. This is not a thesis statement. This is not a thesis statement. It is going to be like probably two or three sentences of your thesis. In my class, I want you guys to write a thesis that does two things. One, it answers the full question. All right? Many of these questions are going to be multiple parts. If you have a question that exists in multiple parts, you must answer the full question within your thesis. And when I say answer the full question, I mean you've got to like give a legitimate answer that I could accept, right? Um, do I have anybody in here that is an athlete? Excellent. Can I pick on you? Uh, you are a, what kind of athlete? Bowling. Bowling. All right, that is not the sport I thought I was going to hear. I thought you played softball or something, too. Okay, bowling. I used to bowl. What's your average? All right. Not bad, not bad. Can we get the door? It's crazy loud. Um, okay, so if you are a bowler or a volleyball player or a magician or uh, what, have, what else do we have here? Sago dancer, a runner. Very good. And any, a marksman? Okay. What do you, what do you shoot? Okay, excellent. Um, okay, now listen. If you play a sport, if you are a bowler, all right, and I were to ask a question, and this might be like a DBQ-style question, where I would say something like this. To what extent is jade 
a good bowler. All right? And then there would be seven documents. And maybe one comes from her bowling coach. And maybe one is a, a write-up of, of, of the rest of it, maybe a teammate of hers. And maybe one comes from an opponent of hers. And maybe one is like just a collection, a table of her statistics over time, like her average and like her spare conversion and all the other things that might happen within bowling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I've got a question like, to what extent was she a good bowler? This is not, in my opinion, an effective thesis. According to the documents, Jade is a good bowler. No, that's not enough. I want to give those specific details that show themselves in the documents. All right? So we're going to go to answering the full question, using the language of the question, which will make more sense beyond our bowling question. Using the language, I want you to use the words that are in the question. It's not like an exact restatement of the question, but use the language in the question. So on that last one, we had African actions and reactions to European imperialism. I want you to use the language African actions and reactions to European imperialism. All right? And then we're going to give specific examples. We're going to include those specific examples. So let's say hypothetically documents one and three talk about how Jade is a really, has a really good form when she bowls. Like it's just like picture perfect, right? Um, and then documents two and five talk about how um, Jade does a good job of like hitting her mark. It's like the spot that she's trying to, to aim at on the lane, right? But documents six and seven say that Jade is not a very good bowler when it comes to spare conversions, all right? So what, and this is how we're, it's always going to be set up. The DBQ is going to, like, give you the evidence to allow you to make some kind of nuanced response to this question. And so in this case, if the question were, to what extent is Jade a good bowler? You look at all the evidence, and documents one and two and three and four uh, and five talk about reasons why she is a good bowler. And documents six and seven give you maybe some reasons why she's still got work to do. You then ultimately have to make an evaluation. You have to answer the question, to what extent? A to what extent question says she's like the best bowler in the history of bowling. Or, on the other side of that spectrum, She's never bowled before in her life. She's absolutely the worst. The reality for almost every question we would ever answer is going to be what? Somewhere in the middle, right? And, but, but do me a favor. We're not going to be fence straddlers, okay? We're not going to ever have a thesis that's going to say, she's both a good bowler and a bad bowler. Because that doesn't make any sense, does it? That doesn't, like, you can't be good and bad at the same time. There could be aspects to her game that are strong, there could be aspects to her game that need work. What we ultimately have to do is make an evaluation. And the, the DBQ is going to set you up pretty well. Notice there's seven documents. I think part of the reason for this is that it makes it pretty easy to have four documents maybe that lean one way and three documents that might lean another way. And if you have four arguments going in one direction and three going in the other, it shows us that maybe... She's better than she is bad. So we could say then something like this in a thesis. Jade is an excellent bowler because she has good form and she's got, she hits her mark well and she does this and she does that well. As seen in documents 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I want to put that in my introduction. I want to actually put the document numbers that this student is going to write. Uh, yes, sir. No, I'm absolutely going to include the weaker aspects. But I like to give the stronger aspects to my argument first. Um, so I'm absolutely going to do that. Julie, did you have a question? I just wondered if you had to make sure the attribute was specific numbers. Yes, I want you to definitely attribute or give the attributes of the specific numbers. The, the only, it kind of makes your writing look a little cruddier because you would never do that in a formal essay. But this isn't a formal essay. This is a DBQ for an AP World exam right? We're trying to get as many points as we want. I want to give you the experience of a reader at the DBQ. We sit in a room, a big, big conference hall, big uh, auditorium or something, and we read the same essay hour after hour, day after day for a full week. It is mind-numbing work. 
we want to make it easy for those people to grade. And so we're going to make sure they know, and we know, that we're covering all the documents. Within your, within your introduction, you should have numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, appearing within your introduction, knowing that all seven documents are going to be addressed. All right, so you're going to say, she's a good bowler because of this and this and this, as seen in these documents. However, her game does need some work, including the areas of spare conversion and shining your bowling shoes or whatever. I don't know. Um, and, and so we're going to acknowledge that. It's important to acknowledge the nuance in an argument, right? And then I'm going to have a concluding statement where I'm going to say, despite these faults or despite these challenges, Jade, because of the overwhelming evidence, is a good bowler. Because you ultimately have to have an answer to that question. I should be able to read your introduction, your thesis, and know what the question is and what the answer to your question is. Okay? You are not answering the question all just throughout your body. You're answering it up in your thesis. You should be able to give your thesis to your math teacher, who has no clue about what we do in this class, and say, what is the question I'm answering and what is my answer to it? And if they can do that, you have written a good thesis. Is everyone clear on that? And it's going to make much more sense when we actually get into a DBQ. So I'm going to have an answer of the full question using the language of the question, and I'm going to give my specific examples that are coming from the documents. Okay? I need, then, to get into my body. Now, the nice thing is, when I give my specific examples, I'm like saying documents 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 say she's a great bowler. That becomes the topic sentence of my first body paragraph. A lot of my students sometimes struggle with what even a paragraph is. A paragraph is one collection of ideas referencing one topic sentence. Your topic sentences all support your thesis. So in this first body paragraph, we're going to write all about all these documents that give us all the evidence that she's a good bowler. And we're going to go through each of those documents. Okay? Document one says she does this, and it, that shows she's a good bowler. Document two says she does that. Document three says she does this. We are going to describe, this is our next point, to describe those documents. If you do that for three of the documents, like actually describe them and relate them to whatever the question is, in this case, whether she's a good bowler or not, you get a point. You get a point. Just three out of the seven documents. That's all you got to do. This is the easiest point on the DBQ to earn. This is what we would consider like the low bar point. We want everybody to get this point at least. All right? So we're really just describing the content of three of the documents. Now, of course, you guys know that we're not just describing the content of three of the documents. How many of the documents are we going to be using in our paper? All seven. All seven. All right? So by using all seven, we're definitely going to cover this base. I just want to make sure you know that you only need to really have three of them to just get that one point. So if you are satisfied, none of you are going to be satisfied with this. But, but if you are like, dude, all I want is a three on my DBQ and I'm a happy camper. Context, thesis, and then just describe what three of the documents mean. That's three points. And guess what? If you get three points on the DBQ, you are over the world average. It's crazy, right? Not that hard. The next step, the next step for another point, for another point, you have got to use six documents to support whatever your thesis is. You use six documents to support whatever your thesis is. Now, that seems kind of weird. What's the difference between describing three documents that address the prompt or using six documents that support your thesis. There's going to be overlap here. I know what you're talking. What's your question? If not all, or if not six, are in support of your thesis, how do you... They're, they're all going to be in support of your thesis, because our thesis ended up being, she, she is a great bowler despite having these weaknesses. So they're all supporting our thesis. So anyway, really, if you do this one, if you do this one, using all six documents to support your thesis, you automatically are going to get this point, aren't you? So you don't have, this is why I don't like to give kids the rubric because they freak out about this. Just do this and this base is covered. All right? So to use the documents to support your thesis, 
just means, you know, we're, we're going to address how document one supports the argument that she's a good bowler with maybe some faults. Document two does the same thing. Document three does the same thing. We're going to go through that list. It's not hard. Now, you only have to do this for six. So why would we ever use all seven documents in our essay? If we screw up. The AP exam is graded by what's called an asset-based scoring model. We get points for what we do well. We don't lose points for what we mess up. So if you write about seven documents, but one of the documents you don't understand very well, and you, it, you don't get credit for it, you still got six that'll count for you. What happens if you don't understand two of them? We still have five that are good. We won't be able to get this point anymore, but we can get the describing three. Okay? And you still got a three, which means you're still over the world average and life is good. The next point, the next point is the hard one. It's the, it's the most challenging one connected to the documents. I'm not going to cry one tear if I don't have any students that get this point. Because it's a challenging point to get. It's the hardest point to get. And this is where you have to acknowledge the point of view and how it might influence the opinion or the argument that's being made. Okay? You're trying to acknowledge the historian's part or the document's point of view. Now, when you look on, on your test prep book, it's going to talk about historical context or intended audience, uh, perspective, point of view. You've heard these words before, right? I just like to call it all point of view. Where is the document coming from that might shape what it's talking about? All right? So, for example, if there's a document from Jade's mom about what a wonderful bowler she is, Jade's mom probably loves you. Does your mom love you? Yeah, okay. Do you think sometimes our moms are a little like, um, they, they might overinflate our good qualities sometimes and might sometimes overlook our, our faults, maybe? That's what moms are supposed to do, right? So I might take that document and use it as support of an argument, but I would acknowledge, I would say something to the effect of, however, because document three comes from Jade's mom, who is like almost in the rule book, made to love her and value everything that she does, this might possibly be an overflated, overinflated opinion of Jade's abilities. Okay? And if I, were, if I were a historian doing more research, I would kind of get more evidence from people that aren't your family. All right? Or, or another one. Uh, let's say there was a, uh, you go to, what school, Stevenson? <coughs> Utica. So let's say it's a bowler from Stevenson. Oh, no, Jade's terrible, right? Well, if it's, a, if it's a bowler from a rival school, they might, like, overinflate your faults. You know what I'm saying? So we can acknowledge that. And if you do that for three documents, you will get a point for, for that handling, that analysis of the documents, kind of giving that argument as to why this opinion exists, why, how we should understand why this opinion exists and how it might shape whatever the interpretation is, Okay? Like, and, and why do we have to do this? Because if we're a historian, and I'm trying to find, answer a question about what a tremendous bowler Jade was when she was in high school, I wouldn't want to talk to just her mom, her dad, her sister, her brother, her uncle, her cousin. I'd want more of a varied response coming from a lot of different environments. Coolio? Yes, ma'am. So if we're, like, say in paragraph one, we're talking about, like, three of the documents. Yeah. Uh -huh. I like to work these in right along with the describing of each document. Uh, uh, not, I wouldn't do it in your thesis. I, not in your thesis, but once we get into the body paragraphs. That's where I like to work those in. Mr. Newman. You, you can craft it however you'd like. Um, and you're gonna, each DBQ is going to be its own. I would say most of our DBQs, they're probably going to be two or three different groups that we could assemble out of those seven documents. So it's probably going to be two or three body paragraphs. There's no rule on how, like, remember when you were in, like, sixth grade or fifth grade, and they were like, a paragraph is, I don't know, five, six, seven sentences? That's not really a rule. I don't know who came up with that idea. Or that a sentence has to be a certain number of words. That's all made up. So a paragraph could be a longer paragraph or shorter paragraph. What is a paragraph? A collection of support of a topic sentence. So if your topic sentence is, she's a good bowler because of these reasons, 
then that's all your support that's going to be in the paragraph. Or you could break that paragraph up into two if it's going to be too cumbersome. There's like four different reasons. Maybe you break it in. She's also a good bowler because of these reasons. And now those two paragraphs are about that. Yes, sir. Yeah, abs I would make that definitely a separate paragraph. Absolutely. All right. Then there's additional info. Then there's additional info. You can get one bonus point for bringing in some little nugget of knowledge that is not within the seven documents, something that you know about, all right? Maybe one day I was flipping through the channels and I stumbled upon some high school bowling match and it featured Jade and I got to watch with my own two eyes and I got to see some things and I know a little bit about her as a bowler from my own experience. Now, on an AP exam, it's going to be from the things we discussed in class. Maybe you're going to bring some knowledge in from what you learned in APUSH last year, whatever it happens to be. But you're going to offer some piece of evidence that supports your thesis, says she's a good bowler, maybe not a great bowler, whatever, whichever way we're going, that's coming not from the documents but from your own knowledge. Yes, sir. Well, who knows? It, all you're doing is dropping one piece of historical evidence. Do you remember when we talked about the African actions and reactions to European imperialism? There was no, a number of those documents talked about violent reactions to the Europeans. There was not one document that talked about the Zulu in South Africa and how the Zulu fought against the British and actually defeated them in an early battle. So if you were to write about the Zulu as an additional example of a violent African action to European imperialism, bonus, you get that point there. That's a really easy point, but that's the one you have to come up with on your own, okay? Then there's the final question, there's the final point. I hate the final point, but I love the final point. The final point, um, I raised some of it up there, but the final point is, is talking about, like, just an exceptional understanding of the historical processes involved. <laughs> I hate that language. I like to consider that final point like this. Did you write an awesome essay? The final point is like the, the bonus, the feather in the cap to the kid that writes a great paper from beginning to end. There's a lot of things a student can do to get that final point. Notice, to get this point, you've got to use six documents to get the support. If you were really good with all seven of your documents, I'd give you that final point. You can remember the synthesis point that you all hated last year where you had to kind of connect it to another time period or something like that or another subject? If you do something like that, you could get that extra point, right? If you just write an exceptional paper that handles all the documents well and there's nuance and we understand that there's like there, there's two sides of an argument, you might get that final point. We're not going to try to get that final point, all right? I'm not going to like have that as a box that we all check off. What I think that you're going to do is, if you do all of these other things well, you're going to get that final point. So don't feel like that's an additional task you have to do. I really want you to get it here by using all six of the documents. Coolio? All right, beautiful. That's your DBQ. You don't have to get a seven. You don't have to get a six. You could get a five, a four, and still be getting a five on the AP exam. All right? You could go down to a three or a two and still get a three or a four on the AP exam. It's not hard. Say it with me. This is not hard. So, guys, we, we might be talking to literally a dozen or two people around the world when they watch this on YouTube. Convince them that it's not hard. This is not, not, hard. not hard. Guys, some of my videos literally get like 50 people watching them. I know. We need to convince them. It's not hard. You can do this. 